Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, the ABCs of Electronic Eligibility. Before we begin, let's go over a few housekeeping items. If you are on the line and have not yet connected to the webinar, click the link in your confirmation email. Your browser may prompt you to download and run a file. When you are connected, you should see the presentation on your screen. If you have questions, you can send them via WebEx's chat function. Please take a moment and find the chat bubble icon near the bottom and center of the webinar screen. You can type and send questions throughout the presentation. We will compile them and take time at the end for answers. This webinar is being recorded and a copy will be made available to all attendees after the event. Now it's time to begin. I will turn it over to my friend, Sarah Vandermeulen. Thank you, Chris. All right, everybody. So uh, as Chris said, my name is Sarah. I'm the corporate trainer here at UHIN. And today, I'm excited to be talking about the ABCs of electronic eligibility. So this is going to be a bit of an introduction to eligibility, where we're going to talk about what it is, what it does, and uh, make a case for how you could use it in your office. Now here's a more detailed look at what to expect. We're going to start off with defining some terms. I'm a big fan of uh, being assured that if I say a phrase or a, an acronym, that you guys are thinking of the same thing I am. So we're just going to level set and make sure everyone is on the same page. Then we're going to talk about how eligibility works. Because there are actually a couple of different variations of eligibility, and knowing how they work will actually inform our decisions on how we can use it usefully in an office setting. Once we know how it works, then we can talk about the value and the difference that it can make in an office workflow. After that, we'll talk about different ways to access eligibility because there are multiple options. And as with life, they all come with their own pros and cons. So I will do my best to lay all of those out for your consideration. And then we'll go over workflow and talk about the different ways that you can integrate eligibility into a workflow and different considerations to keep in mind as you're making those decisions. And then at the, time, or at the end, we have some time set aside for some questions and answers. So first up, let's start with defining those terms. And I'm going to start with the biggest, easiest one, eligibility request. So an eligibility request, uh, just if we break it down to the, the most basic possible idea, it is all about figuring out, does the payer recognize this person, this patient or subscriber? And if they do recognize them, uh, are they covered with some sort of coverage and benefits for the service in question? Is there going to be some kind of payment at the end of all of this? Technically, I could call a payer and ask for this information over the phone, and that would be a type of eligibility request. However, for today's purposes, because I'm talking about electronic eligibility during this webinar, go ahead and assume that if I use the term eligibility request, I'm referring to the electronic eligibility request. This is where you enter some basic patient information into a software program on a computer, it gets sent out electronically, and a response comes back electronically. Speaking of electronic requests, the code for this is the 270-271. So if you're on payer websites, clearinghouse enrollment forms, there are lots of different places where you're going to see this code pop up because this is what we payers and clearinghouses uh, think of when we think of eligibility. But uh, just to break it down, the 270 portion of that is the request. So anyone who sends out the electronic information asking for uh, coverage and benefits, that part is the 270. And then, of course, that means the 271 is the response. So when whoever holds that insurance and coverage and benefit information sends it back, that electronic response is the 271. Now this brings up a point that I want to make, which is that the 270-271 being an electronic transaction uh, is and must be standardized. This is really the only way that electronic transactions work, because uh, if you think about it, these electronic systems, they have to work on their own uh, automated so that they're not being constantly overseen by people, which means it has to be very standardized in order for that to work properly. Uh, electronics are very bad at making leaps of logic. Now what that means uh, on a practical side for you guys is that it gives you a little bit of flexibility in software options. Because if your software is creating a compliant 270-271, 
then it means that regardless of the look and feel of the software, regardless of how easy it is to work with or to log in, it's creating the same kind of information on the back end. So if you're using one software and you decide to switch to another one, well, from the receiver's end, they don't really care. To them, it looks like the same transaction. So you have a little bit of flexibility on your end. The other thing that it means is that being standardized and being electronic means that you could have an entire request response cycle and human eyes never set on that transaction. So it does mean that with these automated systems, we can actually take advantage of that flexibility uh, because automated systems never sleep. And we'll go into that a little bit later when we talk about workflows, but just keep in mind, automated systems mean that we can use it outside of normal working hours and we can make that work to our advantage. Now I've talked a little about request response, let's go into some of the players involved in this request response. The first being, of course, the provider. Now the provider, when I use that term today, I am including hospitals and doctor's offices and labs and DME and assisted living and all the places that are providing some kind of service that they're then submitting for medical reimbursement. I am also assuming for today's purposes that it is the provider creating the 270 or the electronic eligibility request. I know there are some cases in which that is not what's happening, but the vast, vast majority of the time, it's providers. So today, when I talk about the sender, the requester, I'm, I'm really talking about the provider. Now, many providers have a practice management software, which is then managed by a practice management vendor. Some of you guys may know this as an EHR or electronic health record software. Uh, they've become synonymous over the last couple of years, but technically speaking, an EHR is covering the clinical side of managing an office. So it's got vitals, it's got care plans, it's got op reports and medical notes. Practice management software specializes in helping with billing and scheduling and tracking insurance information. And you may have a software that does both. Uh, but for today, when I talk about practice management softwares and vendors, I'm referring to a software that can do the billing and the insurance information uh, or the sp that specific part of a software that d also does other things. Now, after uh, a practice management software has done its work, things typically go to a clearinghouse. Clearing houses, if you're not familiar with them, are kind of like a, a very fancy post office. UHIN is actually a clearinghouse. We're all about getting information from point A to point B. And we do some stuff in the middle. You know, there's validation and scrubbing and all sorts of fancy routing. But at the end of the day, it's all about getting information electronically from point A to point B. And then, of course, if we're delivering something, we have to be delivering it to somebody. And in this case, that is going to be the payer. The payer is going to be the insurance company, and for today's purposes, I'm assuming that the payer is the one who holds the insurance information and is creating and sending the 271 response with the coverage and benefits information. Again, there are going to be some cases where it's not the payer doing the response, but again, just for simplicity for the webinar, go ahead and assume that it's the payer returning that information. Let's take a look at this with a little bit of a visual and start talking about how eligibility works. There are two main ways that eligibility can be transacted. And the first way begins with a provider creating the eligibility request. They're going to include some basic uh, information about the patient or subscriber. This is the 270. This is going to be sent to the clearinghouse, then to the payer, and then the payer is going to respond back with the coverage and benefits on the same connection. This is considered real time and it takes 20 seconds or less on average. So um, that is an average. So during a peak time or maybe if you catch them while they're doing maintenance, it might be longer. But in general, real time eligibility is going to be 20 seconds or less. In fact, my experience is that it's mostly much, much less. They're very fast. Now you'll notice that the icon I used for the eligibility request response was a single sheet of paper and that was on purpose. And that's because even though there are some few exceptions, in general, real-time requests and responses are usually on individual transactions, so a single patient or a single subscriber. Now, there is another way that eligibility can happen, so let's reset. 
The second method involves the provider creating the request, but this time they create multiple requests. This is usually done with a practice management system. They get multiple patients and subscribers. They get all that information together, bundle it up into a batch, and then they send that through the clearinghouse to the payer. Now, instead of sending the response back on the same connection, the payer is going to take in all of these requests, and there can be anywhere between one and several thousand requests in a single bundle, so it might take them a little bit. So they're going to get all of those answers and coverage and benefit in, you know, information together, and then they're going to send it back as one big batch. And that is going to go back to the provider, and they're going to receive it all at once. This is, as you might have guessed, called batch eligibility. And the timeline for that turnaround is somewhere in the ballpark of minutes or hours. It depends a little bit on the payer, and it depends a little bit on how many requests were in the file. So you can imagine one or two requests are going to probably come back quicker than one with several thousand. Now, I don't want to imply that batch eligibility is less valuable because it's slower than real time. They are both valid ways of doing eligibility, and they actually complement different areas of a provider's workflow. So they are equally valuable, but they're just used in different ways. And again, that's something that we'll dig into deeper when we get to the workflow area. If you need an analogy, uh, if you think about it as real time being like a phone call, you pick up the phone, ask a question, get an instant answer. A batch would be more like a fax or an email. You send off a larger piece of information, and then someone on a separate connection at, a, at a, some later point will send back a larger set of information. So again, used for different purposes, but both very valuable. Now inside each of these eligibility requests, you're going to find this kind of information. Now this is just a screenshot of UHIN's eligibility tool. So it's not going to look like this in every software. And if you're doing big batches, it will probably look nothing like this. But it's going to have a lot of the same types of information inside. So as you can see, I've got member ID, first name, middle name, last name, and date of birth. Now, one of the really interesting and valuable things about eligibility is that all of these fields are optional. And when I say that, I mean that not, none of the fields are required to be there 100% of the time. What you do need to do is give the payer a combination of fields that's enough for them to work with, because they need to be able to receive this request and have enough information to find that patient or subscriber in their own system. If they find an identity match, they can send back a response. And when they do that, they'll actually include all of the demographic fields. So if you had to leave a field out because you didn't have the information or because you weren't sure that it was correct, then you could leave the field out. And assuming it's enough information for an identity match, you're going to get all the correct information from the payer system in the response. And then you can update your own records. So just as an example, let's say that I was sending an eligibility request, and I had the member ID, the first name, and the date of birth, but for some reason, I didn't have the last name. Maybe it was a case where it was a hyphenated last name, and I wasn't sure if the payer had the hyphen in their records, or if they had left a space, or maybe if they ran both last names together. These are all different possibilities that could happen, and I want to make sure before I submit my claim. So I could send this off, and odds are good that I'm going to get a response with how the payer has the last name in their system. Now, I should mention that not all of these fields are equal in that respect. Uh, if you have to include one, the member ID is by far your best, which also means that if you uh, cannot include the member ID, your odds of getting a match are going to reduce drastically. And the reason for that is that the member ID is going to be unique per subscriber. Uh, and possibly even unique per patient, depending on the payer and how they, they run those. And it's also the ID that all the payer systems are designed to run off of. This is really what they're meant to work with. So if you include the member ID and almost nothing else, you still have a pretty good chance of getting a match. If you can't include the member ID, it's still worth sending it because there are some payers and some situations where that'll still return a match, but just know that your odds are reduced, especially if the name is a common one. So if your patient or subscriber is John Smith and you don't have the member ID, well, you might not be getting a valid response. But if you've got a much more unusual name, well, your odds start increasing at that point. 
When you do get the response, this is a, just an example of how this might look. It's from the UHIN system. Uh, as you can see, it's got the demographics listed there so that you can then compare that to your records or to what the patient and subscriber have told you. If there's a discrepancy, this will give you a head start in figuring it out before the service is rendered. Uh, because, of course, once the service is rendered, the, the time clock to get that reimbursement in before it interrupts your cash flow is already running. Now, in this case, let's say that uh, the date of birth was different uh, and from what the uh, payer sent back on the response versus what I had in my system. Uh, either I could just update my system or I could check with the patient or subscriber and ask them to confirm which one is correct. Another thing to check for is whether you sent off an eligibility request for someone and you listed them in the subscriber fields, but when the response came back, they were listed as the dependent and with a different subscriber. Those are the types of things also that will help ensure that when you send out the claim, you can get it right the first time. So watch for those subscriber and dependent mismatches. There are other lovely GUI details inside of an eligibility response. This one is a, a fairly typical response in the category for professional office visits. So this is just your typical outpatient doctor visit. And there's a couple areas I want to draw your attention to here. First up, you'll see here on the upper left that this is specifically talking about copays. And there's a lot of information on copays in this little section. I can see the amount of the copay, $20 in this case. And there's also an area on the left where I can see whether a copay is attached to in network or out of network providers, because oftentimes there is a little bit of a difference there. I can also see if there are any messages, any specific text. Uh, instructions that the payer wanted to send back to provide some further clarity. The really great value of having this information is really about talking to patients up front about their patient responsibility. I'm sure that most people have had this scenario where, uh, you know, not even implying any kind of ill intent, it's just that patients are much less uh, motivated with urgency after the service has been performed. So if you're able to collect payment amounts that you know are going to be patient responsibility up front, uh, then that can get done quicker and without uh, any hassle. There's another area, too, of eligibility responses that's particularly valuable. So I'm going to bring up another screenshot here. In this one, and again, I'll draw your attention to specific areas, this is about out-of-pocket stop-loss amounts. On the left, we can see that it will tell me if the amount is related to family coverage or individual coverage. And then uh, the last two spotlights there, you'll see that it's got time period information. So the calendar year out-of-pocket stop-loss amount is $4,000. And underneath that, I can see that the remaining out-of-pocket stop-loss amount is $4,000. So I know that they have not met any of their out-of-pocket stop-loss amount. So this, this informs my conversation with the patient. At this point, I can tell them that for sure there will be some amount of patient responsibility for this visit. Now, if the remaining out-of-pocket stop-loss was at zero, then that would tell me that they have met that amount and that the insurance will probably kick in 100% and there may not be a patient responsibility amount up front. So this is again going to tell me how to set up my uh, conversation with the patient so that the patient is informed, they know what to expect, and then of course any proper amounts can be collected or not collected as the case may be. One of the things you'll find is that there is going to be some variation in the amount of detail that comes back from different payers and for different specialties. So this is not uh, operating at the exact same level of detail across all the industry. So if you are finding that you're constantly having to call in to get a piece of information that's not appearing on these responses, please let us know, uh, especially if it's something that none of the payers are sending back in their responses. It could be that the electronic standard version that these are operating off of doesn't allow them to send it back. And that's something where we can play a part. UHIN has seats on many committees on the national level that are working to update these standards. And so if we know that there's a particular problem, we can be your voice on the national level. So when we get to the end, when my contact information is displaying, if this is your situation, please let me know and I will do what I can on your behalf.
Depending on your software, you may also have the option to do a more specific type of request. And uh, this is again just what it looks like in the uHint software. It may look a little different in yours. But what we've got here is service codes on the left. There's actually 187 service codes, and they go over all sorts of different types of services and specialties. Now, if you have a very specific set of needs for your eligibility request, you only need to know, say, about allergies and allergy testing. You could put those service codes over in the area that, that says these are selected, and you could send that off with your request. And that tells the payer that you only want to know about allergy and allergy testing. So you'll get all the details on what they have regarding allergy and allergy testing, and you would not get any of the other details. So it will help you narrow your focus and get a much more specific focused response. Now, if you are not getting responses with the kind of detail you're looking for, make your search more broad because this is another one where it's not supported equally across the industry. I should say though, with both this and the things on the previous screen, the, which are actually called accumulators, where it's showing a remaining amount of a benefit, those types of things are getting better all the time. The payers know how helpful they are, and they have been working very hard over the last five or so years to keep including more and more of that detail. So you're probably starting to get the picture at this point that one of the really valuable parts of eligibility is in its ability to prevent errors during the claim process. Because as I mentioned previously, after the service is rendered, that's when your clock starts to get that reimbursement from the insurance uh, so as to avoid having a disruption in your cash flow. So that's the, that's the part of the process we want to protect. By doing eligibility before the service is rendered, we have the possibility to prevent many, many problems. And I am very fond of saying that it's much better to prevent than to do damage control later. Now, there's a, a point on this that's going to take just a little bit of explanation. For about 10 or 15 years, UHIN has been doing some kind of educational event, and it's, it's morphed a little bit over the years, but we did it annually, and for a very long time, we have had a payer panel where we get somewhere between 10 and 15 payers together, we stick them in the front of the room, and we let the audience ask them questions. However, we've also asked the payers over all these years to come prepared with their top errors that they see on claims and to tell the audience what they can be doing to prevent these errors from happening. I'll tell you that nine out of 10 times over all of these years, the top payer errors can be solved with eligibility and they can be solved before the point when the service has been done. And I'm gonna give you the top five here. The first one is a patient name or date of birth mismatch. So this could happen because the patient name doesn't match with the payer system or the date of birth doesn't match, or the name and date of birth don't match each other. And this could happen for perhaps uh, for reasons like typos, or maybe there was a confusion between patient and subscriber. Maybe the subscriber name and the patient birth date got uh, put together. Uh, hyphenated names or name changes, those are also ways in which there could be some kind of mismatch with the name or date of birth. So again, this is something that eligibility can solve because if you're sending off the eligibility request and comparing the response so that you know if there's a discrepancy in those demographics, well, again, that's something that you can be figuring out before the service is ever rendered. The next one is not eligible. And what they mean by that is that there has been some sort of uh, change or loss of insurance, or maybe they are not eligible for a specific type of service. Uh, there are lots of different levels at which this can apply, but basically, if you have sent an eligibility request, you will know if there is uh, anything being marked as not eligible, especially if you send it as an explicit request with that service type code. And you, you know, I just need to know about uh, mental behavioral health. Well, then you'll get that response and you'll know for sure whether they are eligible or not for that type of service. Outdated policy is another one that came up frequently, and uh, this was happening in cases where the policy was at one point correct, but it is no longer correct. So you'll get that a lot with, again, changes to insurance policies, uh, and also with young adults coming off of their parents' policies, especially in that 26 age range, uh, you're, you're gonna see a fair number of those. Again, something that can be solved by just checking that eligibility response. 
Now the one that says subscriber details, the payers had specifically mentioned that what they usually see here is that the subscriber name and date of birth is not correct. Now I do a lot of initial trainings for people who are new to billing, and I found that it's not always uh, the first thing people think of to note down the subscriber's details. Everyone gets the patient name and birth date and address, but sometimes it's not uh, something that we initially think of to collect the subscriber name and birth date and address. So if you're not already doing that, definitely start collecting that information. If you are collecting the information, uh, just make sure to double check the details. One of the ones that seems to come up is especially with uh, divorced families. You'll have the child who is the patient, a parent is the subscriber, but the parent and the child are residing at different addresses. So those are one of those cases where just make sure to double check some of those details and it'll save you some grief down the road. The last one is payer not primary. So this means that some other insurance is in play and it could be that maybe there's a dual coverage through another insurance and this particular payer thinks that the other area, or the other payer is first on the policy. Now, I should mention that in an eligibility response, if the payer knows that they are not primary and if they know who the other insurance is, a lot of times they'll include that information in their eligibility response. I've also seen a version of this where a specific type of service was outsourced through another payer and the initial payer that we checked with told us this service through another payer and it told us who the payer was so that we could then contact them about benefits. So this is a, another one that is not universally applied throughout the industry. Not everybody does this, and it does depend on the payer knowing who the primary is. But when they can, they do try to include that. At this point, I hope I've been uh, convincing everybody of the value of eligibility. So uh, this is now the point where we get to talk about how you can start applying it and getting access to it for your office. One thing to note about accessing eligibility is that you do need to have two systems that can talk to each other. Now the good news is that all HIPAA covered entities, which includes providers who send electronic files, payers and clearinghouses, uh, were all required to be on the same electronic current version of eligibility. So our computer systems should be able to talk to each other for that. They're, they're speaking the same language. Now, uh, that does beg the question though, if there are HIPAA covered entities, are there non-HIPAA covered entities? And the answer is yes. And for some reason, property and casualty and auto are not HIPAA covered entities. So they're not required to be on the same electronic standardized version. Now, that being said, your odds are still very, very good that any property and casualty or auto place that you want to exchange eligibility with there's a pretty good chance that they actually can because even though they're not required to be on the current version, they, mo they know most of the people they do business with are. And so if they want to be uh, interacting with you guys, it's best in their best interest to be staying updated and keeping up with the rest of the industry. So if you want to try this with property and casualty and auto, go ahead. Just know that there is no guarantee that they will have a compatible system uh, to accept the electronic eligibility. Now, even if you've got all of the versions all in sync and you know the computers can talk to each other, uh, just so you know, some payers require enrollment before you can actually start transacting this electronic eligibility. So some payers don't. It's still worth it to just try submitting and see what happens. But if you get a response back that says something like they don't recognize the provider, then that just means that you need to enroll. It's just kind of a way of giving them a heads up and then they will turn on the connection so that uh, you can start getting that information to flow. If you need to do any enrollment, check with your practice management or clearinghouse. I know that UHIN assists our members with doing this kind of enrollment. It could be that other clearinghouses do as well, so it's worth a shot. And then if you never work with your clearinghouse but you go through your practice management for everything, it could be that that's something they would assist with as well. So just check with your contacts and see if you can get any help if this is something that you need to do. Now, as far as actually creating and sending the information to the payer, there are a couple different ways that this can happen. And it, this is the part where I get to try and outline the pros and cons of each of the options. The first one is through payer portals. 
So this would be when you log on to a payer website or portal and you type in some information about the patient or subscriber and then they respond back pretty much immediately with the information all inside that portal. This is uh, based off of sort of a real time type of uh, structure. So you're doing individual requests and you're getting individual real time responses. The pro of using a payer portal is that they sometimes have access to additional helpful hints that are not sent through the standardized transactions. This depends on the payer. So some payers will have them, some won't, but that is a possibility. The con of using a payer portal is that you would have to log into each payer portal separately. Depending on how many payers you're working with, that can equal a lot of logins. The next option is a clearinghouse portal, which is very similar to a payer portal in the sense that they're usually uh, based on a real-time uh, workflow as well. So you're usually going to log in, you're going to type in some basic patient information, and then the response will come back individually uh, but real-time. The pro of using a clearinghouse portal is that you can typically access many, many payers through the same login so that you don't have to be constantly logging in and logging out of different websites. The con of using a clearinghouse portal uh, would probably just be that it doesn't have access to any of those extra uh, helpful hints and tips that you might find on a payer portal. Depending on your setup, you may also have the option of using a practice management system. So if you have a practice management, check with them to see if they offer electronic eligibility. Just so you know, not all practice managements do. But if they do, check to see whether they can do real time and or whether they can do batch. I think it's a little more common for practice management to do batch, but it's a possibility and I have seen it with some that they can also do real time. So again, just kind of depending on which practice management you have, this may be a very good option for you. The pro of using a practice management system for your eligibility is because it's all very integrated, it makes for a very smooth workflow. And if they offer the batch option, that means that you can get large volumes of eligibility done with relatively little work. The con of using a practice management is that sometimes it costs extra. So check, when you're checking with your practice management about whether they can do eligibility, make sure to ask for pricing because sometimes it does cost a little bit extra uh, or it's a module that you have to enable. So just double check with your vendor. It, even if it costs extra, I just want to reiterate how valuable this transaction is. Because if you're preventing problems before they get to the part where they're uh, imperiling your cash flow, well, that seems like a really good option. The last one is what I'm calling third-party eligibility. So in this situation, I'm assuming we've got an organization that does most of your billing needs. And maybe let's, for example, say it's a practice management and they can do batch real time, or excuse me, they can do batch eligibility, they can do your claims, they can view your reports, they can do your posting. But maybe it doesn't offer real time. And remembering that real time and batch complement different parts of the workflow, let's say you do want real time, but you also don't want to get rid of your practice management because they're good for everything else. Well, this is where you might go out to a third party at another company that will do just the electronic real-time eligibility. I know that UHIN serves as the third party for a number of people, and I'm, I'm pretty sure this would be standard, but we do have reduced pricing for people who just want the eligibility. So as you do your research, if you want to go to a third party company to get this eligibility added, I, I, it should be pretty affordable, and I would definitely recommend checking into it. The pro of doing this is that you get to add in missing pieces of functionality. And then the con would just be that because it's not integrated with your usual system, you might end up having to enter a little more information manually than you would have with maybe a different option. Now, when it comes to actually checking eligibility, there are three main points in the workflow that are especially popular for this. Now, I'm just going to say up front, I'm not going to advocate that everybody does all three of these workflow points uh, for checking eligibility, because that would be a bit intense. But mixing and matching is going to be the name of the game. So first up, we've got at the point of scheduling. When you schedule the patient, this might be, for example, a good time to do a real-time eligibility check. You're on the phone with them. You're saying, I'm scheduling you for the fourth. Can you give me your insurance number? I will check and see if you have a copay. 
So you check it while you're on the phone with them. And then before you hang up, you've confirmed their appointment, you've confirmed they have a $25 copay, and that they will be prepared to present both their card and their copay at the time they come in. These are again being proactive to prevent problems from coming up, and patients really like having that heads up so that they know what to expect. So at the point of scheduling is one possible time for checking eligibility. The next one is the day before. Uh, keeping in mind that there can be a very long gap between scheduling and the actual appointment, and of course, you know, if you have a couple months in there, a, a lot of things can change with a patient's medical needs and history in a month, or even a couple months, uh, then you may want to check it either for the first time or even again the day before they come in. The day before is close enough that we're pretty sure nothing major will change uh, before they actually arrive. And it's also going to give us a little more wiggle room because we don't have the patient arriving, you know, in the next hour or when they're standing right there. So if we need to push it out 15 minutes or a couple hours, do it at night, we have that option. This would also be an excellent time to do a batch eligibility request. Remembering that automated systems never sleep, uh, we could use that to our advantage here. So if you have a practice management system, you highlight all of your patients for the next day and you say create eligibility. And of course the actual workflow will depend on your software. But let's say you do that. It bundles it all up into a batch, it sends it off, and it may take hours to run, but that's okay. You're gonna go home and enjoy your evening and it's gonna be running overnight and it will be there waiting for you when you get in the next morning. The third option is upon arrival. Especially if you accept walk-in patients uh, when you need to double check and see what their insurance is, if they have any, if you take it or also when you have those inevitable moments when a current patient only remembers to tell you upon their arrival that they have had a change in their insurance. And then you need to update your files and find out the new copay and all of those lovely details. So depending on your number of patients and your workflow and how often patients are arriving, uh, arrival may be a good time to do some of those eligibility checks. Now again, you don't have to do all three of these, but I would, uh, I would encourage you to consider mixing and matching one or two of them uh, to see if that would work with your particular office. So if you have a large number of patients, I would probably recommend that you check when new patients are scheduling and doing a big batch the day before. Now, if you don't have access to a practice management that will do big batch transactions, uh, you can still try to do them uh, at night after everyone is gone, there are no patients there, it's less distracting, and you can just get those real-time ones sent out and then logged back in pretty quickly. And that again is part of the automated eligibility system because it doesn't sleep, you can use that to your advantage. Uh, and I just wanna put out there for your consideration that if you are worried about how this would impact your workflow with your patients, push as much of it outside of office hours as you can, and that will reduce the impact on your patient-related workflow. If you have a very small number of patients uh, or you accept mostly walk-ins, then arrival might be the best time, or maybe you do scheduling and arrival. Again, just think about how you can mix and match. As you're thinking about this, I have a couple of considerations to put in front of you. One is just to remember that an eligibility response is not a guarantee of payment. It can give you a snapshot of a patient's eligibility at the time that you checked. If there's a big gap between when you checked and when you submit the claim, uh, the payer can't give you a heads up on the future, right? So if there are a limited number of visits, for example, for your service type, and you saw the patient checked their eligibility in January and they had plenty of visits left, but if you don't submit until September, and another provider billed for other visits in the meantime, you may need to go through the process of making that a patient responsibility because all the insurance visits have been used up and now they won't cover anymore. That's another workflow and sometimes not as pleasant a one if you have to go after a patient for payment. So just something to consider. It's a good thing to follow up good eligibility practices with prompt billing. And just always remember it's not a guarantee. I also still recommend having a copy of the insurance card. Now, I know I just spent a, a little while telling you about how you can get all this information from the eligibility response, but keeping the insurance card 
or a copy of it is still a good best practice because if something comes back on the eligibility response that raises questions, you have at least one avenue to explore before you have to go bugging the patient or the insurance. So if you get a date come back that's different, say the, the patient birth date, uh, if that's something that they put on the insurance card, you can check there. If the name was different, you can check the insurance card. If they say patient not found, you can see maybe did you put a typo in when you were putting in the member ID. These are all things that you can double check before you have to go to the patient or the subscriber and ask them to verify the correct information. If you're a UHIN member, you actually already have access to this eligibility, and I would definitely encourage you to try it out. There's no extra charge for it, and we really like to see people prevent issues with their uh, claims billing process. So if you haven't used it before, just head out to our main website and go to the Members tab on the upper right. You'll see a drop-down like the one I've got pictured here. And I know it's a little small, but you're going to be going and looking for the one that says My UHIN. I'll put a circle around it here. My UHIN I know doesn't say anything about eligibility, but My UHIN is uh, our one-stop shop clearinghouse portal, or at least it will be our one-stop shop. Uh, as we are upgrading our products and services, all of the new and updated ones are going to live in My UHIN. Eligibility was actually the very first one to be moved over. So you can go to My UHIN and do all of your eligibility real-time through there. Once you get to the login page, if you have logged into MyUHIN before for any reason, just log in and look for the button for coverage and benefits. If you haven't ever logged in before, but you are a UHIN member, look on the bottom right under the sign in button for account upgrade. That will walk you through a process. It will ask for some login information for a different UHIN product. That will help us identify that yes, you are a UHIN member. And then it will help you create a login specifically for MyUHIN. At this point, I would like to go ahead and take questions. So remember, if you have any questions, submit them via chat, and then Christopher will read them out, and I'll answer as many as I can. All right, thank you again. Take the moment to find the chat button, and we will be glad to answer any questions that you may have. So we do have one question come in, and that is, is it possible to get a copy of your presentation for future references? The answer to that is absolutely yes. In fact, anyone who registered is going to receive a link probably in the next day or so that will link to a video of this presentation. So you're absolutely welcome to view the video, show it to others. If you would like a copy of the presentation itself, I am also happy to send that out. Uh, just keep in mind that a lot of the value was in the commentary, so to speak. Not a lot of the data was actually on the slides. But if you'd like the slides, I'm happy to share them. All right, we have another question. If we use Trizetto and UHIN, who would be considered our third party? Do you interface with ECW? Excellent question. So this is starting to pick up on a, uh, a concept that not a lot of people get familiar with. Um, but basically, clearinghouses often will connect to each other. And we can daisy chain, so to speak, so that a transaction may move through several clearinghouses before it gets to the end destination. If you are using Trizetto as your primary clearinghouse, then I would actually just consider that uh, just your regular workflow. Um, if, if you only used Trizetto to send your eligibility, then Trizetto would be your third party. Now for the second part of that question about do we interface with ECW, the answer is yes. We do have customers on ECW who are sending directly to and from our system. So if that's something you're interested in setting up, just please let us know and we're happy to look at your setup with you. All right, sorry, we have another one and it's a two-parter. The first part is, we have heard that all payers in Utah must provide eligibility information. Is that true? That is an excellent question. So the answer is that if they are going to provide eligibility information, they need to provide it up to the current standard. So if they're going to do it at all, they have to do it properly. Uh, however, as of right now, I'm afraid I don't think that they are required to provide eligibility support for electronic eligibility. 
The second part of that question reads, do they have to make 270-271 transactions available so that we don't have to check their individual payer websites? Uh, and this, I, yeah, I can see why that would be uh, put in with the first part. So I'm afraid that they are, as far as I'm aware, not required to support a 270-271. Now, that being said, most of them do because they know how much it reduces their call volume. And if they do support a 270-271, they have to support the minimum standards on that transaction. We have a question and a statement. The statement is from Angie Jackson who says, "This is that is so great, thank you. And the question is, do you foresee ARP, AARP, allowing electronic eligibility requests in the future? That is an excellent question. You know, I have always been of the opinion that this is this transaction is going to be just increase, 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 because again, it reduces payer call volume. Now we have seen a, a recent move where a number of payers have been investing a lot in their payer portals, and there may be a couple that are really going to put their energy there rather than in the 270, 271. But the volume comes with the 270, 271, because a payer portal usually is a one by one, and if they are getting a, a hundred thousand calls it's unlikely they're going to get someone inputting 100,000 eligibility requests directly into a portal. However, you could have an automated system do that in a very short time. So I personally am of the opinion that it's quite likely, especially if the providers and the subscribers to that insurance are telling the insurance that they want it. If they keep getting noise from their community that says this is a valued transaction and we want you to do this, it makes it more and more likely that they will do it. All right, again, if you have a question for Sarah, please put it into the chat box. It doesn't look like we have any other questions. If you do think of one later on, you have Sarah's uh, contact information there on the screen. Thank you everyone for joining us today, and let us be the first to wish you a very happy Thanksgiving season. Thank you all for joining us. Bye-bye.